Welcome to Through the Bible in a Year, lesson number six. Let's start with a word of prayer. Lord God, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the blessings of being in your word, and I thank you for the people that are taking the time to um, make it this far in the study, and I just pray for the stamina that we need to, to stick with it for the rest of the, the year, and I pray that you bless this time we have together as we take a look into your word, that your word becomes even more alive in our hearts and our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to um, lesson number six. And before I get started, it was through the Bible in a Year program. I began it um, over 20 years ago um, when I was served in Salt Lake City, Utah. And um, I did it there. I did it at Christ Church Lutheran in Phoenix. I did it um, at Shepherd's Gate in, in Michigan. I use it as well at Shepherd of the Desert. And, and so on and off for more than 20 years, I've I've um, been a prop proponent of this study, and I just see how it blesses people so much because Jesus, he said, make disciples. And one part of that command was teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And, and what I see with that is he commands us to, to learn his entire word. And, and so I commend you for being a part of this journey. And, and um, some parts of the Bible are you know, a lot easier to understand than others. And, and you know, God gives us what we need for this life. And there's so much more um, about God than what is in, in the Word. In fact, even in the book of John, towards the end of John, he makes a statement that if I was to write all the things about the life of Jesus, not even all the volumes of the world could contain all the information. And so, you know, we see here, um, I guess, B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving earth, that God gives us what we need here and to direct us through this life and on to eternity through faith in, in Jesus Christ. And, and today we're going to take a look into, especially into the sacrificial system of the Old Testament um, church as we start out in, in, um, in Exodus, finished Exodus and go into Leviticus. And then um, we'll be doing more studying in Matthew. So let's jump into question number one. And it's the last question dealing with our study of Exodus. And the question is in, in Exodus 40, um, 36 through 38, how are the Israelites guided? And how are we guided in our lives? And, you know, we see through Exodus how, how God is just very uh, involved in a very you know, obvious way in their lives, that they had the, the pillar of fire by night and the, the cloud by day that would guide them on their path. And, and wouldn't it be great if we had it that easy today? And, um, but actually, God does guide us. But now we have the Holy Spirit and His Word to guide us and direct us in this life, and and um, as we conclude Exodus, you know, we, we see there how how God, you know, He led the people out of Egypt, and He He leads them, you know, across the Red Sea through the wilderness of sin, all these incredible miracles. But so often we see the hard heartedness and the sin of the people. And the common denominator through all Scripture is that we as human beings are all sinful. Every one of us uh, makes mistakes, and we see that commonality throughout all the Scriptures, and. As we go to Leviticus, we're going to be seeing the sacrificial system that they had back at that time and, and how ultimately Jesus has fulfilled that system once and for all. And, and so there's five different types of, of offerings that the people were to, to give. And um, one was called a burnt offering, question number two. And the burnt offering was one done as an act of complete surrender to God, and, and the purpose was to gain acceptance and, and access to God, and and they would, you know, give, you know, depending on on what they had for financial means. It could be like a ram, or it could be different types of, of animals. But the entire sacrifice was was burned. This was a complete sacrifice to God, and so it was a complete act of surrender to God. Um, the grain offering, question three. Obviously, they're an agrarian society. They have cattle, they have crops, um, and, and so they carry grain with them as well. And, and, and so rather in place of an animal, they gave portions of their grain, again, as an act of a surrender to God, an act of, um, of to gain you know, acceptance and more you know, direct presence into, into his, his very his presence. So it was a, an act to get closer once again to God. Um, Question four, the fellowship offering. This is a little different. You know, it was giving of, of typically meat um, in various forms, you know, to um, the priests. And, and, you know, it would be done as an act of, of um, 
fellowship where people would come together, maybe with some of the priests, some of the families come together and um, almost like God is there, is present with them and they have this, this meal with this sacred meat and, and an act of fellowship and, and just being in the presence of, of God with, with other people. Then we get into the, um, the sin offering and there was, there was two different types of, of um, sin offerings, one for unintentional sins, one for intentional sin. And the type of offering to be given was, in again, accordance to what their means were. For those that didn't have much, maybe it was a, a pigeon or you know, turtle doves or it could be a goat or a ram or um, sheep, depending on their, you know, what the individual offering of sacrifice possessed. And... A portion of this sacrifice of the blood was, was used as, you know, could not be eaten. Um, and that was used as an act of, of, um, of sacrifice that they viewed life was in the blood. We view life, as, you know, blood as death, symbolic of death. You know, for them, um, blood was symbolic of life. And the whole idea was for our sins that a payment had to be made. You know, even in the Bible, it says that the wages of sin is, is death. And, and in the Old Testament, you know, they had to offer the life of an animal in place of their sin and that blood was shed in place of the shedding of their own blood and that that blood was sacred and and um but still portions of that sacrifice were then given to the priests you know for them to to eat um, but the sacrifice was done to take away um, their sins whether intentional or, or unintentional sins and the ultimate fulfillment of these sacrifices is jesus giving his life once and for all and then we have um, the guilt offering. And the guilt offering tied into their system of, of worship. And there was all these different rites and different um, things they had to do, you know, to be ceremonially clean and, and um, to do certain worship rites. And if they unintentionally messed up one of these rites or they were to offer a guilt offering, once again, in accordance to what their financial means were. And sometimes there would even be additional um, offering on top of that, up to like 20% in addition to whatever that sacrifice was. And, and again, you know, portions of these sacrifices went to the priests and to their families um, since they didn't really have the opportunity to, you know, to have lands in the same way that the rest of the people of Israel did. So again, different types of offerings. Um, there's a lot of tie-in with this between the Old Testament and the New Testament, but you know, thankfully now in the New Testament, Jesus has fulfilled those sacrifices and, and once and for all through the shedding of his blood um, to bring to us eternal life and salvation. Question seven, what similarities, differences, and symbolism do we see in the Old Testament offering system compared to what we give in offerings today? Now, when you think about it, you know, they had to do this for their forgiveness, okay? So there was a, an act there to gain forgiveness. We don't obviously give offerings for our forgiveness. So Jesus has given to us, you know, forgiveness. He's fulfilled the Old Testament system. And um, we're not an agrarian society to the degree that they are back then. So we typically give, we give financial gifts, you know, to God for the work of, of ministry. Um, he never did away with, with the tithe, but, um, you know, in our day and age that, that we should, should give out of love, you know, and obedience to God that, that, um, you know, the whole thing with, with, we're not given out of, shouldn't be out of obligation because Christ loves us because he's given us all that we have, that God has blessed us in so many ways that it's our desire to be obedient back, to follow his word and to, to give back in and, and love, and not out of obligation, but pure love and, and obedience to, to Christ's love for us. Question eight, what part of the cattle were the people of Israel not to eat? And, and typically we see they're never to eat the blood and, and, or the fat. You know, sometimes there might be other portions they would not eat, but in particular those two things um, were forbidden for them to eat. Question nine, did the priests eat the entire sacrifice that was offered? If not, what was done with the rest of the sacrifice? Now again, depending on the type of sacrifice, like the burnt offering, the entire thing was, the entire offering was sacrificed and burnt. Um, other ones, portions were burnt, um, but the rest was given to the priests, you know, for their consumption for them and their families. Question 10, where did the rite of ordination come from? Are there similarities in how ordination was done in the Old Testament compared to how it is done today? And you know, so we see with Aaron and, um, and his sons that there was this incredible rite of ordination and all kinds of rituals and, and different types of sacrifices made. And, and the, 
Aaron and his, and his the, the priests, they were set apart from the rest of the people to represent God. They stood between God and, and the people in those very sacred positions that they had. And, and they were the ones allowed to go into the holy place or the holy of holies, whereas the, the people of the congregation back then, or the, the Israelite people, um, they weren't allowed to, to enter those places. They could go into the outer court. Um, but the, you know, the priests would do the sacrifices for them. And... Um, and even in this day and age, too, we have the right of ordination for pastors. And, and the whole idea of the pastor is set apart to serve the people. But what's different in the New Testament times is even though the right of a pastor or ordination is a very, I guess you could say, a sacred thing, we're all, as, as people, part of the priesthood of all believers, that because of Jesus' sacrifice, we all have direct access to God through Jesus. And, and, and we all can serve you know, uh, and go to God directly. Um, in the Old Testament, they had to go through the priest for pretty much everything. For we as pastors, we're here to serve you and, and to administer the sacraments properly, to share God's word with you. But we're all a part of the priesthood of believers. We all have a very important calling in life, but still the, the office of ministry is one that's set apart for, for those who are called to, to serve God in that special way. But every one of us has our own special way of serving God. Question 11. Why did the people of Israel sacrifice in the way that they did? Number one, it was by law. You know, God laid the laws out for them to, to do this. And, and also, they, it was necessary for them to do this for their forgiveness. And it was a very holy and sacred thing that they did as they were part of these sacrifices and, and uh, a way for them to, to get right with God and to be brought into his presence. Um, but again, too, it was as part of their system of worship. And, and we see how things have changed from the Old Testament to the New Testament um, as far as that is concerned and the fulfillment that Jesus brings to that once and for all. Question 12, what kind of diet did the people of Israel have? And again, it's, it's, if you read through it, a very strict diet. There's certain animals, there's birds or reptiles that they were not to eat. And um, a lot of it was there in this community, you know, in that day and age, um, health was very important. And, and they were, had to be careful not to eat or of things that would cause sickness or, or disease. And so they had a very strict system of what they could and, and could not eat. And I'm sure a lot of that um, was for the sake of the health of, of the people and the health of the, the community. And certain um, things as well were not considered very sacred or holy. And so those particular types of animals as well were not to be eaten. Question 13. What is the purpose of these detailed rules and regulations? You know, the system of law they had was very strict. It was, you know, very detailed. And again, a huge group of people. And they didn't have the, the things we have today as far as medicines. And, and um, you know, so it's very important for them to um, be careful of anything that could cause harm to others and, and, and to keep the rules and keep the law straight, to keep people to, to live in love and respect for one another and for the foreigners around them. So the whole idea was for the sake of, of unity, of, of oneness, of, of um, you know, a life that was you know, peaceful and, and, and calm and, and showed forth love. And in fact, even the, the summary of all the Ten Commandments, for example, is, 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 is to love, how to love God and how to love one another. And, and a lot of the other things, you know, as far as their um, rituals for what they could and could not eat, as far as their health um, things, it was for the, the sake of the entire community to keep a oneness and to keep the community safe. So that takes us through the um, Old Testament section for this week. And now we're going to jump into Matthew. We're going to start with um, chapter 23 and about verse 23 and beyond that is going to go through 2654. And question one, as we get into kind of time about, you know, section about the end times, the second coming of Jesus, which of the signs that Jesus gives of the second coming have been fulfilled. Now, you know, there's talk about there's going to be wars and rumors of wars and natural disasters and pestilence and famines and, and lawlessness and a lot of things that are listed there, which, to be honest with you, have been happening for, for centuries. Um, one that's given that um, we're going to see repeated from the other Gospels is that before the end comes, the Gospel must be proclaimed to the entire world, then the end will come. And, and so, um, you know, a lot of the things listed are have been fulfilled. You know, that one about the Gospel proclaimed the entire world 
you know, it's probably getting closer. We don't know, even when it's done completely, it doesn't say it's gonna happen right away. And so um, we see a lot of these different things have been fulfilled, and, and, but still the end's gonna come when, when God wants it to. Um, the second question, what are some of the false Christs or false prophets of our day? Now, in Revelation, it talks about an antichrist, and we see reference, you know, in scriptures about antichrists or false prophets, and they've been around for centuries. You know, anyone who leads people away from Jesus would be considered a false Christ or a, a false prophet, and they're all around us. And, you know, so often what they do, these false religions, is they take scripture like Satan has done, we've seen in, in Genesis and also in Matthew, he twists the scripture. And a lot of these so-called cults and, and um, you know, false religions, you know, the, the whole idea is, is, is to lure people in and then to, to lead them astray and to, um, to misrepresent the scriptures. And, and anyone who acts in that way or any or, organization, institution, which is against Christ, um, that persecutes Christ and his church, I guess you can call them an antichrist or a false prophet. And this takes many different forms and shapes. And I believe in our day and age that that persecution is, is growing. It's becoming stronger. And there's more of an open season on Christianity than there has been at any point in my life you know, so far. And, and, um, and so we're actually living in a time in history where it's called post-Christendom, you know, for the time of you know, the Roman Empire. Um, all the way to probably, you know, maybe a decade ago, is called the time of Christendom. And now we're living in this post-Christendom world, and, and, and things are changing. In a lot of ways, it's more like the first century um, than any other time in history, where the church is just getting started in a lot of ways. And, and what's important, we're going to see more and more as, as we go through Scripture, is that, and learn about that first century, that the key is not just to be church members, you know, but to be disciples, to be people that share God's word and live it out on a daily basis and, and show the world who Christ is through what we say and through what we um, do. But in the meantime, there's, there's persecution. People are going to try to really persecute us for what we say and what we believe as Christians. Question three, what does 2435 mean? And this talks about the heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And, and you know, beautiful words, that, that God's word is eternal. In this life, we have a choice. There's the world and there's the word. And the world's temporary. It's here for a while and it's going to go away. And a lot of people, that's what they're chasing after. That's their messages comes from the world. That's their focus is on worldly things and worldly addictions. This is temporary. Whereas God's word is eternal. God's word lasts forever. God's word is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And, and so when it comes to what we choose between the word and the world, I commend you for taking time to be in God's word more regularly. And, and we will never um, look back at our lives and say, boy, I sure wish I read the scripture less. If anything, we're going to think, wow, I wish I would have spent more time in the word because the word has the answers for life and for eternity. The world does not have the answers. What does 24, 39, and 40 mean? Now, it, there's a section here that talks about there could be like two in the field, one's taken and one's left behind. And there was a series that came out for a while there. It's called the Left Behind series. And it was a series that you know sold millions and millions of books. And, and I read some of the books just to see what they were saying. And, and um, what they claim is, is that, that um, at some point, Jesus is going to come back and he's going to take the believers to heaven. And then there's going to be this time period up to like a thousand years where people have another chance to, to turn their lives around. And, and um, that's nowhere in the Bible. You know, the Bible indicates, we're going to see this as we go through the rest of the scriptures, that, that when Jesus comes back, the first, those who have died in faith, are their bodies are resurrected and their souls are reunited with their, their bodies. And then the second thing is that those who believe are taken up to heaven to receive glorified bodies bodies and 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 then eventually um, those who do not believe they are left behind but for that final judgment it's not going to be a thousand years or seven years whatever is, is being taught by different groups that that when it's going to be a one time sequence of events that's going to take place and 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 so that the danger with the left behind series it may give people the false impression well if i miss the first bus to heaven i can maybe catch another one later and there's no indication in Scripture that's the case whatsoever, that we need to be ready now. And the parables of Jesus make that even more clear as we go forward. Question five. What is Jesus going to come back? Should we live in fear of this? Why or why not? You know, we don't know when he's going to come back. 
Um, you know, the year 1000, that was exactly a thousand years, you know, after, you know, Jesus' life, that around that time, um, people took the millennium, the thousand years, very literally, and they thought that Jesus was going to come back at that time, and, and most of the world seemed to come to faith and believe in Jesus at that time. And But then after that, when he didn't come, they kind of went their own ways again. I mean, even the disciples thought that maybe he was going to come back in in their lifetime. You know, no one knows. Um, he's going to come back when he decides, but we shouldn't fear this. I mean, as long as we believe, we're ready. That's the bottom line. If we believe in Jesus right now, we're ready for his return. We shouldn't fear it in any way that, that when he comes back, again, he's going to be taking us directly to heaven. We never have to face death. Um, we're going to receive our perfect resurrected bodies, whatever that's going to look like. We'll talk more about that in future sessions. Um, and it's something to look forward to. And we're going to experience dimensions of heaven, which, I mean, heaven is so far beyond what we can possibly imagine. Um, and But the reality is, if we believe now, we're ready. And that ties into this next um, question. Who is a bridegroom in 25, 1 through 13? What symbolism do we see in this? Now, the bridegroom is Jesus. And they didn't know when he was going to come back. And so, you know, some of the people had, they didn't have um, oil for their lamps. And they were just kind of, you know, goofing around and not paying attention and getting distracted by the life. And then the bridegroom comes, they're not ready. And they get shut out of this wedding. Um, and the point being, we don't know when Jesus is going to return. And people might think, well, I'll, I'll worry about, you know, this Christian, you know, walk later in my life. You know, I got, you know, I want to just get in the world and do all kinds of things in the here and now. Um, that's living dangerously. You know, there's eternity at stake here. And the best thing that we can do is be ready right now by believing in Jesus Christ. And if we believe in Jesus Christ, we've got oil in our lamps. We're ready for him to come back anytime it happens. And we, again, we don't need to fear that event. It's something to look forward to. Question seven, what is the meaning of the parable of the talents? And this is a, an amazing parable. And we learn a lot about God from this parable. And so he gives, you know, one guy one talent, another guy two, another guy five. And, and he tells them to take their talents and put them to work. And, and the one guy with five multiplies it, gets ten. The one with two gets, you know, doubles that. And the guy with one just goes and buries it. And and what we see here is that, that um, you know, Jesus... You know, the, the, in this situation, it's actually the, the owner, you know, representing, you know, Jesus or, or God. Um, he comes back and, and he wants the, the people to give account. And, and the one with the most, um, you know, he doubled his. And, and, and the guy with the second most, he doubles his. And, and, and we see that the, the owner is like, you know, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful to a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. But the guy with the one that buried his town, that didn't use it, the owner is angry. He's fiercely angry that he did not take what was entrusted to him and, and use it for the purposes for which he intended. And he's severely punished. And, and the one talent he has is taken and given to the guy with, with the more. And so what we see here is if you want to tick God off, waste what he's given to you. He wants us to be accountable with what he's blessed us with. He's blessed us to be a blessing to others, not to hold on to our stuff for ourselves. And in fact, nothing we have is our own. It all comes from God. We're, we're managers of what he's given to us and to, to use it in the right ways. And, and when we use it in the right ways, we're blessed. And we're, and we're to use it in ways that have eternal significance. And that's the, the ultimate way he calls upon us to use our resources. The things this world are going to come and go. We're not going to take anything with us when we go, except only our soul is going to go. And, and what's most important are the souls of the people around us. That's what should matter to us the most, is that we want all people to, to know the Savior that we've known and to use our resources to help build in His kingdom and spread His kingdom through the work we do through our church and through our lives. Um, this is what matters to God the most. In fact, you think back to the Lord's Prayer, the whole prayer is about eternal matters, except for give us a stay or a daily bread. And even that is, you know, half dealing with spiritual bread and the other half maybe the, the physical bread. Um, that what matters to God are eternal things. And the things of the world are very temporary. And we put way too much emphasis on those things in this life. The sheep and goat judgment. The goat is a satanic symbol used in Satan worship. Um, where do you think this imagery came from? And what symbolism do you see in the sheep and goat judgment? 
And so in the sheep and goat judgment, you know, what we see is, is a separating of the, of the sheep and, and the goats, you know, and, and um, if it's misread, it can be assumed that it's based upon works, what people do. Um, but in the end, you know, Jesus is very clear. You got you know, to understand Scripture, you got to let Scripture interpret itself. And the idea is that if we believe in Jesus, the works that we do in his name, they matter, okay? They don't go away. Um, our sins are gone. However, for those that don't believe in Jesus, the bad things they've done are still with them. And so it's like there's going to be this separation um, at, the, at the end where the unbelievers are like the goats who kind of go astray and, and go their own way. And then there's the sheep following the, the good shepherd, the, the believers, symbolic of the sheep that, that go on the path to, to salvation and eternal life. And, and um, you know, I pray that and God wants all people to be as sheep and, and to follow um, his plan of salvation, which is fulfilled in Christ, and to believe in Jesus. And that's what he wants for, for all people. And um, so I hope that goat line is short. And that's our job is to make sure that there's no one in that goat line, that, that all people come to know the love of Christ. And, and but unfortunately, there's many who rebel against Jesus. Um, read 26, 8, 9 and John 12, 4 through 6. Who is the most upset about the woman pouring perfume on Jesus? What does this individual do right after this event? Now, it's interesting, the writer of this gospel, Matthew, the tax collector, he thinks that since he's the financial guy, that he'd be taking care of the, um, the bank account for the, the Jesus and the disciples. But he's not. The one put in charge of the money is Judas. And he's very upset on how um, the, the perfume is being poured upon Jesus and, and of great value that it should be cashed out and the money put into, the, into their coffers. And, and so... You know, he doesn't understand what's going on, and it seems like maybe money got the best of Judas, that, that um, you know, that money may have become his God somehow, because, you know, shortly thereafter, he goes to betray Jesus for a sum of money, for 30 pieces of silver. And, you know, so um, it's very unfortunate that he chose that route, and, and so we, we see that, um, you know, here Matthew notices that, that, you know, points the situation out, again, a, a money situation, how... How Judas seemed to really have his priorities um, mismanaged and uns not very straight in his, his life and mind. Question nine. What event has taken place of, of the Passover in the New Testament church? Now, in that Passover, um, you know, Jesus said those words of institution. And what he did, he transitioned the Passover, you know, to his own sacrifice he was about to make. You know, that the whole imagery of the, the Passover was, a, you know, they were to take the, the lamb and, and to take the blood and put it on their door frames and the angel of death would pass over and, and, and Jesus is the lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world that, that he fulfills the Passover. And, and so in place of that Passover, what is given now is, is the Lord's Supper as that Passover meal that we drink of the, the wine and, and, and of the bread. And, and through that, that wine and bread, Jesus comes to us and touches us with his very um, presence. And, and so um, Jesus fulfills that Passover. And that took place in that upper room that, that Thursday before um, Easter Sunday. And that sacred meal is something that we partake of. And, and again, we're touched by Christ's very presence and, and the fulfillment of, of the Passover of the Old Testament. Question 10. What feelings are going through Jesus in 26, 36 through 45? And here he is, he's at the Garden of Gethsemane. And, you know, being God in human form, he knew everything before it was going to happen. Sometimes, you know, we can, we can be thankful that we don't know what's going to happen. You know, that we kind of walk through life blindly. If, imagine that you knew that, you know, in, in a short period of time, you're going to experience the most painful form of death ever invented by mankind. You know it's going to happen before it even happens. In fact, the Bible talks about him sweating drops of blood, you know, which is a um, thing that actually happens, medical condition that happens when stress is so great that the drops of blood come through your pores. Um, and so he is, you know, he's feeling um, trouble and, and sorrow. And, and um, as a human Jesus is in, crying out, so to speak. He even wants his disciples to, to, to be alert and to stay awake with him. And, and um, he knows what's coming. And, the, you know, the... Obviously, still controlled by the Holy Spirit in fullness, God in fullness. Um, 
he's, he's going through this event, but he's still a human. And, and everything he went through, um, he felt the pain. He felt the anguish. He's just like any one of us. So we have a God who came to be as one of us. And, and he understands what we go through. And, and he went through more than, than we can ever imagine. We think we have it bad. Our God and, and Jesus went through more than we will ever experience as far as pain and suffering in this life. He did it for us. And he understands the challenges we go through. The last question, notice that what Jesus, what Jesus called Judas, um, even after he was betrayed in 2650. What does this say about Jesus? And so, you know, Judas leads this band of people to Jesus. He knew that Jesus was going to be at the Garden of Gethsemane. And, um, and Jesus greets him as friend. You know, it's just amazing. You know, friend, you know, basically do what you need to do, you know. And, and um, that even being betrayed by one of his own, he still, he still loves Judas, you know. He, he's loved everybody. And, you know, he love the sinner, hate the sin, you know, but, you know, you just see his character. That, you know, Jesus' whole purpose was to love his Father and to love um, people. And he does it all the way through. He loves everybody. And he shows that example, even in this difficult situation where, you know, someone so close to him turns him over to, to be killed. And he still loves him and calls him friend. And what a great example for all of us to, to live out, you know, the, the example of Jesus. That, you know, his whole thing was, you know, the greatest of all the commandments, to love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbors, yourself. And he does that all the time. He never deviates from that. And that should be the purpose in our life, too, to love God and to, to love our neighbor. So once again, congratulations. You got through Lesson 6. Um, keep at it. And um, let's close in prayer. Lord God, we thank you for your word, and we just thank you for your example, Lord Jesus, how you went through so much for us. You suffered, you know, so much. And you suffered to, and died on a cross to, to fulfill all those Old Testament sacrifices and um, to take away our sin. That, that for sin, there has to be payment for, you know, for what is done. You know, one life in place of another. And, and you've, you gave your life for us because you love us, each one of us individually so much. And so the way to heaven is open for us. Our sins are, are taken away and, and, and we have no guilt. And we pray now that, that you will help us in this freedom that we have to, to live our lives more according to your word and, and to live our lives um, like you in, in love for, for you, O oh Father, for you, God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and, and, f and for all the people in this world, no matter who they are, help us learn to, to love people. Even if we don't like what people do, it's okay to, to hate the sin, but help us to learn to love people in all situations. And we know we need your help to do this. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week.